With countless stories that have emerged after the Second World War, many revealing the absolute cruelty man can inflict on one another, there is one tale that is as savage as the rest, but shows the true brutality of nature. On today's episode of Never Stop Learning, we will be taking a look at the worst naval disaster in American history. The story of the USS Indianapolis, her history in sinking, as well as the story of survival for those lost and forgotten when she sank. The USS Indianapolis, Portland-class heavy cruiser, entered service on November 15, 1932. At a length of 610 feet and a crew capacity of over 1,200 men, Indy was a formidable force in the United States Navy. Even though she was a heavy cruiser, the ship was still able to reach a top speed of 32 knots. Along her center line, she carried three 250-ton turrets, each loaded with 8-inch guns that could hit a target up to 18 miles away. Indy was also able to launch small aircraft with her two aircraft catapults, located midship for launching of her four float planes. Prior to the Second World War, Indianapolis participated in several significant naval missions, from escorting President Franklin Roosevelt on his travels to South America for the Good Neighbor Cruise, to conducting extensive training exercises. The ship and crew had already established a distinguished reputation by the time America joined the Second World War in December of 1941. During the Second World War, Indy earned 10 battle stars for her participation in various conflicts from the Battle of the Aleutian Islands to the Battle for Okinawa. It was during the invasion of Okinawa on March 31, 1945, a gunner on board Indianapolis witnessed a kamikaze plane drop down from the clouds on a suicide run for the ship. The gunner managed to hit the oncoming plane, but his target had already been set. The plane struck the port side of the ship, and upon impact, a bomb released which pierced all five levels of the ship, detonating in the water below. This would be enough to sink any vessel but Indy's crew snapped into action, sealing all the watertight bulkheads before the ship reached her flood limit. It was at this point that a chain of events began to unfold that would seal the fate of the USS Indianapolis and her crew. Crippled but not defeated, Indy was forced to return to Mare Island Shipyard in California for repairs. For close to three months, the USS Indianapolis sat in dry dock as repairs were made, but on July 12th, Captain Charles McVeigh received his next mission and the ship was prepared to sail four days later. With the ship back in operation, 250 new recruits straight out of boot camp would also be joining the ship for her next mission. On the afternoon of July 15, 1945, Indy sat at Hunter's Point on a normal day, this pier would be a hive of activity, but not today. A pair of army trucks cruised along the deserted waterfront before coming to a stop next to the Indianapolis. Indy's crane was lowered and hooked to a crate roughly the size of an automobile, which it then raised and placed on the main deck of the ship. Next, two soldiers were ordered to pick up each end of a metal pole. Suspended from the pole were a pair of shiny metal canisters. The weight of these canisters was immense as the two soldiers struggled to carry them aboard the ship. Only a handful of people knew at this moment that the atomic bomb components for Little Boy had just been placed aboard the Indianapolis. At 8 in the morning on July 16th, Indy departed from Hunter's Point for the Hawaiian Islands. The ship and crew wasted no time as this voyage broke speed records, traveling the 2,091 miles in only 74 and a half hours. Upon arriving at Pearl Harbor, some of the crew noticed that the normally busy harbor was entirely deserted. 
This meant Indy could pull right up for fuel and supplies. Once moored, Captain McVeigh denied anyone from disembarking. Indy was loaded with fuel and supplies before setting sail again six hours later. On July 26th, the Indianapolis and her top secret cargo arrived at its destination, Tinian Island. After the cargo was unloaded, Captain McVeigh set course for Guam to prepare for the ship's next mission. In Guam, McVeigh was given orders to depart on July 28th and proceed to the Philippines for training. Meanwhile, deep beneath the surface of the Philippine Sea, Captain Machisura Hashimoto of the Japanese U-boat I-58 was in search of his next target. I-58 had orders to move on a heading of 160 degrees to attack enemy ships off the eastern coast of the Philippine Islands. On the evening of July 29th, Hashimoto ordered I-58 to surface and opened the conning tower hatch, filling the sub with fresh air. The surface radar operator scanned the vicinity before shouting possible ship 90 degrees. Captain Hashimoto took out his binoculars and caught a black silhouette on the horizon. He uttered a single word, dive. The men jumped back in the ship. They had their next target. As the sub moved into position, the darkness made it extremely difficult to determine the size and class of the ship in their sights. Hashimoto prepared to launch Type 95 torpedoes at the oncoming ship and six were loaded. As the target moved closer, Hashimoto gave the order to fire. Six torpedoes ejected from the tube, spreading out like a giant fan as they distanced themselves from the sub. Just after midnight on July 30th, six warheads headed towards the enemy warship, but for the crew of I-58, time seemed to stand still as they waited in anticipation. If you've enjoyed this episode so far, make sure to give us a like and subscribe to see everything else this channel has to offer. The first explosion rocked the ship as I-58's torpedo hit the bow, tearing it almost clean off the front of the vessel. It was later reported that it peeled back like opening a can of beans. Before anyone had time to react, a second explosion occurred midship. The way that a torpedo is designed to work is truly a marvel of engineering and physics. The initial pressure blast is designed to buckle the ship's skin and weaken her internal framing. The blast also punctures a massive hole in the ocean beneath the target. The displaced water then crashes back into the void, crippling the target even further. Below deck, everything turned to chaos. Some men attempted to stop the inferno consuming the ship. Others got to work closing the watertight bulkheads that they could to stop the flooding. Others still attempted to treat the wounded while waiting for orders from the captain to abandon ship. But the order never came. On the bridge, Captain McVeigh learned that the comms were down and they were unable to communicate with the rest of the ship. An officer was sent to Radio 1 with orders to send a distress signal. Lieutenant Commander Casey Moore, who had already been forward and seen the devastation, arrived to inform the captain that the ship was going down rapidly by the head. As the water quickly began to fill the ship, Indy slowly began to list to her starboard side. Anyone still alive below deck attempted to make their way topside. Men began cutting down life jackets and distributing them amongst themselves, many knowing now that the ship was doomed and jumping from the deck into the water. The ship was now listing roughly 20 degrees to starboard, and on the bridge, Captain McVeigh knew that the ship could no longer be saved. He gave the order to abandon ship. Down in Radio 2, Chief Warrant Officer Woods was still tapping away at a distress signal. The starboard list made it incredibly difficult to stand, so Woods braced himself against the bulkhead as he tapped out the SOS. It had now been 10 minutes since the Japanese torpedoes had found their mark, and by now the ship had rolled more than 90 degrees to starboard. The stern lifted high out of the water, and anyone still aboard the ship 
jumped into the blackness of the Pacific. A thick layer of fuel oil covered the sea and stuck to the survivors, burning their eyes and coating their skin. Anyone unfortunate enough to swallow this toxic substance immediately began vomiting and choking as they fought to stay afloat. Captain McVeigh was one of the last to leave the USS Indianapolis. His final objective aboard the ship was to make sure that a distress signal had been sent out. But by the time he had reached the radio stations, they had both been flooded. Now, 12 minutes after the first torpedo had crippled the ship, she sank beneath the waves. Of the 1,195 aboard the USS Indianapolis when she sank, roughly 900 made it into the water. As the ship was still moving when she sank, survivors were spread out across miles of open ocean. There were few lifeboats, and many men were left floating without life jackets. To make matters worse, they were stranded in some of the most shark-infested waters in the world, and no one knew where they were. For the remaining survivors, the nightmare had truly just begun. The oceanic white-tipped shark is one of the most aggressive sharks in the world. When the ship sank, the explosions would have caught the attention of every shark in earshot, and with hundreds dead, the blood in the water would have been irresistible. The first night, the sharks mostly attacked the dead floating on the water. When the morning came, the survivors grouped up and linked arms together to increase buoyancy. This also helped to improve morale and kept the sharks at bay. It was reported that men could see dozens of fins circling them as they floated before hearing a scream, only to realize that there was one less man in the group now, as the sharks had dragged him away. As the hours passed by, the men waited for rescue, but it never came. The hours turned to days. Without food or water, men became delirious. They would see illusionary islands and begin swimming towards them, only to be eaten by sharks once they left the group. If someone died, the group would release the body to appease the sharks and grant them a few more hours of life. The survivors of the Indianapolis were in the water for four days and five nights. The Navy had no idea that the Indianapolis had sunk. There was no system in place to alert them that the ship hadn't arrived at its destination. On August 2nd, hope appeared as a speck on the horizon. While on a routine air patrol, Lieutenant Chuck Gwynn spotted the telltale bronze reflection of an oil slick on the surface of the sea. He followed the slick for 30 miles discovering groups of oil-covered men in the water, separated by miles of ocean. He sent several radio messages to his base that initiated a rescue effort for the remaining survivors. One pilot, now circling survivors, Lieutenant Adrian Marks, witnessed a survivor getting eaten by a shark. He decided to break protocol and land his plane on the water. They managed to pick up over 50 survivors there were so many men on the plane that they had to rest some on the wings. Rescue ships raced to the scene, guided by the coordinates provided by Lieutenant Gwynn and his crew. They maneuvered through the ocean, plucking up survivors from the clutches of the unforgiving waters. Of the 1,195 men left aboard the Indianapolis when she sank, 316 of the nearly 900 men set adrift after the sinking survived. There was a major investigation into the incident, and they found that there was a major flaw in the way that the Navy tracks its ships. The fact that no one had any idea that the ship had sunk was a huge problem. Also, Wood's efforts to get out a distress signal had been received by three different radio stations, but all had failed to act on it. The first was drunk. The second had been told not to be disturbed and the last had assumed it was a Japanese trap. Captain Charles McVeigh survived the incident, but was blamed for the sinking. After an investigation, he was never able to live down this tragedy, even though it really wasn't his fault. In 1968, at the age of 70, he couldn't take it anymore and took his own life. 
This tragedy led to many changes in Navy protocol. The movement report system was created to keep track of ships that don't arrive at their destination, as well as any ship with over 500 sailors aboard now requires an escort. If one of the ships is sunk, the second can provide rescue and send out a distress signal. Thanks for watching this episode of Never Stop Learning. Give us a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already, and check out this playlist. Until next time. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me to the end. Consider checking out our patron page to donate and help fund new videos. And if you have a shipwreck that you would like me to cover, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.